Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, Israeli forces seize the Rafah border crossing, closing a crucial route for humanitarian aid into Gaza as Hamas agrees to a ceasefire. That any deal that would release the hostages but would also allow Hamas to claim some sort of a victory is unacceptable to the Israeli side. Plus, student protests continue across the globe. Here at Rutgers Newark, an encampment led by pro-Palestinian students enters its sixth day. We really want to be on the right side of history to be against genocide, to be against apartheid, and to make sure that the university in which we fund with our tuition and with the people's taxpaying money is going to the community. Also, Congressman Frank Pallone is seeking to safeguard Americans' privacy from big tech companies as TikTok sues the federal government. And student surveillance. Newark Public Schools will install over 7,000 AI cameras to combat the rise in youth violence. They say that these cameras will help make schools safer. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. President Biden today issued a clarion call for Americans to fight the rising tide of anti-Semitism across the U.S., calling this a moment of crisis for the Jewish community during a somber, closely watched speech addressing the Holocaust memorial ceremony at the Capitol, linking the horrors of the Holocaust to this October 7th attack on Israelis carried out by Hamas. His remarks come at a pivotal time of the war in Gaza, with Israeli forces seizing control of the Palestinian side of the Rafah border crossing, carrying out intense military airstrikes overnight that killed entire families and dozens of Palestinian civilians and children. More than 34,000 Palestinians have been killed since the war began more than seven months ago, as fears mount over a full-scale invasion of the southern city, which has been vital for getting humanitarian aid into Gaza at a time when those on the ground say northern Gaza is experiencing a full-blown famine. It also puts negotiations with Hamas about a potential ceasefire on edge. Israel hasn't accepted the proposed deal brokered by Egypt and Qatar, but is engaging in talks, making the situation even more delicate. For more on that, I'm joined by Trita Parsi, the executive vice president at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Trita Parsi, good to see you. Let me just reiterate that Israel has not accepted the terms of this proposed ceasefire, but is engaging in talks. What does that mean exactly? What does that look like? I think what it means more than anything else is that the Israelis are very wary of being portrayed as the ones who are standing in the way of an agreement, which has been revealed to be the case in the last 48 hours because Hamas did agree to a draft of the proposal, uh, which would include the release of all of the hostages. But it would also include an end to the fighting. And what is now becoming very clear is that under no circumstances would the Netanyahu government agree to end the war until Hamas is completely defeated, which, of course, seems extremely unlikely to be achieved, which then means that the war would just keep on going. Is that, would you say, the main sticking point when these negotiations have happened in the past? Because it seems anyway like uh, the sides have gotten to this point and the negotiations get tripped up uh, on the same subject. It has very much been uh, part of the challenge, which is how many hostages for how long of ceasefire. And again, uh, the explicit aim of the Israeli government is the total defeat of Hamas, which then means that any deal 
that would release the hostages, but would also allow Hamas to claim some sort of a victory is unacceptable to the Israeli side. I think a larger, deeper problem, frankly, is that the hostage release and the ceasefire has been connected to each other in a negotiation. Because it essentially means that as long as the hostages are not released, Israel's indiscriminate bombing of Gaza is then justified. And it is not, because it is a violation of international law. This is part of the reason why the UN resolution that was passed disconnected the two issues. While it may make sense on the surface to make them contingent upon each other, reality is that it has led to a situation in which we neither have the release of the hostages nor a ceasefire. I'm curious then how this, uh, the airstrikes that have been carried out uh, in Rafa, the, around the Rafa crossing uh, on the Gaza side, may or may not uh, have an effect on the talks that are ongoing. Uh, it is not yet the ground invasion that has been anticipated, um, but it also does not take that off the table. Um, does that put this in an even more precarious situation? It certainly does, because we are already starting to see new images of horrific, horrific damage and death that is caused by these airstrikes. And I think we've reached a point also that for the first time we're seeing the Biden administration uh, hinting at uh, limiting arms sales to Israel as a result of the frustration that they're having with the Netanyahu government not agreeing to this uh, exchange that had been negotiated. Is there a role, too, just of the general international pressure that's been escalated? And, of course, I'm thinking about the, the campus protests led by students, uh, the movement there. Does that have a role here? I certainly think it does. Uh, now, of course, President Biden says that these protests have no impact on his thinking on this, I frankly don't think that is true because he is seeing his own uh, re-election prospects slipping in the polls. And a key reason for that, not the only, but a key reason for that, is the manner in which he is angering his own base, his own supporters, who got him elected four years ago with this approach to Gaza that has allowed Israel to now kill more than 34,000 people, continues to arm and fund it, while it's increasingly clear that even if the hostages are released, Netanyahu simply will not sign on the dotted lines because he does not want to end this war. Trita Parsi, always good to have your insight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Governor Murphy today criticized Rutgers University for its response to pro-Palestinian protesters on campus, agreeing to meet eight out of their ten demands. Murphy argued the administration dealt with the group differently than it did with complaints from Jewish students about anti-Semitism. Meanwhile, demonstrations continue at Rutgers Newark, where students are requesting the university to do more than divest from Israel, but also reinvest in the Newark community. Melissa Rose Cooper has the latest. We really want to be on the right side of history to be against genocide, to be against apartheid, and to make sure that the university in which we fund with our tuition and with the people's tax paying money is going to the community, going to the students, going for a good cause within the university. So for the past week, students at Rutgers Newark have been spending their days and nights taking part in this encampment to show their support for Palestine. But unlike other schools and universities, the people taking part in this encampment are not only calling on Rutgers to divest from Israel, they also want the school to reinvest in Newark's communities. An example of that is we want all Newarkers to be able to go to Rutgers for free. We want pro bono legal services from their law school. We want free medical and dental services for the residents of Newark. And one of my, the one I'm most passionate about, is we want Rutgers to give some of its properties back so we can start a community land trust and build free housing for the residents of Newark. Anthony Diaz is a member of the Newark Solidarity Coalition and helped organize this encampment. As a lifelong Newark resident, he says the lack of affordable and quality housing is shameful ultimately leading to other issues. And so you wonder why we have an increase in violence. You wonder why we have an increase in houselessness and homelessness. You wonder why we have a, a economic genocide going on. If people have home instability, how can the rest of the, the, the city be, ever be stable? 
the encampment at Rutgers Newark comes as students at the New Brunswick campus wrapped up days of protests following an agreement with the school to support a majority of their demands. Now, a spokesperson for the university confirms President Holloway will head to Washington later this month to discuss with congressional leaders how the school handled the protests. This comes as Holloway has faced criticism from lawmakers, including Congressman Chris Smith, who expressed deep concerns about the deal made with protesters. I think that it's great that the students at New Brunswick were able to organize around that. But we also here in Newark, we wanted to point out that New Brunswick isn't the only Rutgers campus. So it's not really possible for them to negotiate for all students and all faculty and all communities that are affected by Rutgers. So we support them. We support their ongoing communications with the president, with the board of governors. Um, but we also have something to say as a part of that community as well. A spokesperson for the Rutgers campus issuing a statement saying, our highest priority is the safety of our students, faculty, and staff. The protests on our campus remains peaceful as an anchor institution in Newark and committed collaborator with many community partners, Rutgers Newark is earnestly engaging in dialogue with the protesters over the concerns they've expressed. As the encampment at Rutgers Newark enters the second week, participants say they're committed to making a change and will stay here for as long as it takes. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Mental health help is now just a click away for New Jersey college students with an announcement today by the Murphy administration that it's expanding a free 24-7 digital mental health services program, first rolled out during the pandemic to great success. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, the goal is to reach more college students in need of support and fill gaps where campus services fall short. Young people have been facing a mental health crisis for some time from the rise of social media to increase academic pressures, the impact of the pandemic, and much, much more. In fact, 70% of college students have reported heightened levels of stress and anxiety, according to the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education. So today, Lieutenant Governor Tahisha Way announced the Murphy administration's expansion of funding for a free counseling service on New Jersey's college campuses called You Will. Which allows uh, the state of New Jersey to provide 24-7, 365 teletherapy, crisis connection, and wellness pro programming at 45 institutions. It's part of a $26 million funding allotment from American Rescue Plan funds given to the Office of Higher Education to expand the state's partnership with You Will through mid-2025. It's already been offered on several campuses, including here at Montclair State University, over the last year. In just over a year, over 11,000, almost 11,000 students have registered for the platform and more than 33,000 sessions have been held. 61% of the students registered on the platform indicated that they had never previously made an appointment with a therapist or mental health counselor at their institution. And despite the record number of mental health calls that came from Montclair State University students this year, President Jonathan Capel sees it as a sign that stigma around mental health is no longer what it was. You wouldn't have that happening if students were ashamed or shy about raising their hand and asking for help. That's awesome and an indicator of their future success, as several speakers pointed to the statistic that a student struggling with mental health is twice as likely not to graduate. This is an event that's about student success. This is an event that's about graduation rates. This is an event that's about the future of New Jersey. And an opportunity to take on the realities around inequity in this space, says Capel. It's important to recognize the fact that the mental health challenges that have set people off course have disproportionately affected communities of color and others who are underrepresented. It feels amazing. Like, it's just so exciting for me to know that I do have those services when I need them. And they're free services. They're super accessible services as well. So I know I can just call up someone or go online if I do need someone at any point during the day, whether it's at 11 p.m. after class or 7 in the morning before work. This is very, very important to me, hearing what you will does and the fact that this is going to be available to students throughout the duration of the Murphy administration. Assemblywoman Katz has introduced a bill that would continue the funding for this program long after the Murphy administration ends. She believes these next two years will prove this program works. On the campus of Montclair State University, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News.
Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. When Newark Public School students head back to their classrooms in the fall, they'll notice a new high-tech addition to their buildings. More than 7,500 cameras equipped with artificial intelligence capabilities meant to keep schools safer. The Newark Board of Education approved a $12 million contract late last week to have the new surveillance installed this summer, all part of an effort to combat the rise in youth violence throughout the city. But security experts warn these systems don't always deliver on their promises. Jesse Gomez reports for Chalkbeak Newark, a content partner of NJ Spotlight News, and joins me with her latest reporting. Jesse, good to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. So talk to me about why the district felt the need to have such a sophisticated surveillance system put in place. Yeah, so we've been keeping tabs on this project since last year when the district had initially said that they wanted to you know, place cameras with artificial intelligence capabilities in their schools. They say that these cameras will help make schools safer. Um, and so ultimately, they're planning to overhaul their what they're calling is an outdated and inefficient system with this new um high-tech system that, again, includes these artificial intelligent cameras um, with these capabilities that will also work with, centers, with sensors to detect uh, vaping, um, also abnormal sounds like gun sounds and things like that. What does the school district community think about it? Uh, parents, other folks who need to buy in on it? Because there have been reports over years, especially from the ACLU, that really raised concerns about privacy and monitoring the students in ways that could potentially be harmful to them? Yeah, so on the ground, we haven't heard much traction specifically on these cameras. But what we do know is that on the ground, advocates and city leaders have called for more measures to reduce youth violence across Newark, not just in schools. Um, just last week, the city enacted its youth curfew. Um, and that was something that Mayor Roz Baraka said was in response to an uptick in youth violence. Um, and just this school year, we also saw shootings outside two high schools, one in November where a 15-year-old um, Central High School student was shot in a drive-by and another in March where two students were shot just outside Westside High School. Um, so again, there is this uh, concern growing in the community about putting uh, better measures in place to help reduce violence among youth and, of course, um, also help reduce crime to youth as well. And so what has the school district said about how it plans to have its own regulations in place on where these cameras are installed, on what exactly they're monitoring, and to make sure that, that privacy issues um, don't come up? Yeah. So the school district hasn't been too forthcoming in information when specifically when it comes to this project. Um, but what we do know through resolutions and board meeting conversations is that uh, board members and the district is on board that th these new cameras won't invade or create an invasion of privacy for students, staff, or anyone else that works in district buildings. Um, they've also said that these cameras wouldn't be placed in places where they are not authorized or where there are concerns with privacy, such as bathrooms and things like that. And so that's where the district says the sensors would come into play. They hope that these sensors placed in bathrooms would help detect vaping um, and any other noises that may come out of these bubbles as well. So you mentioned uh, the citywide curfew, obviously the cameras. What else is the public school district and the city doing or investing in to tamp down on this rise in violence? At the district level, they've over the years, they've placed a number of security measures to just um, beef up those security issues. Um, they've installed metal detectors. They've done training to their SROs or school resource officers. They've invested um, in more training um, and things like that. And also have enacted drug and alcohol policies that uh, the district says that all their security guards are already aware of. And so these measures are supposed to help reduce, reduce um, all of these uh, issues of violence among schools. And again, at the city level, we're also seeing that there's a new re-engagement center put in place where, you know, if uh, youth that are found uh, outside for a few hours on the street will be taken to. So we do see these efforts um, and these ongoing efforts uh, happening across the city and in public schools. Jesse Gomez is a reporter with Chalkbeat Newark. Jesse, thanks for coming on and sharing your reporting with us. Thank you so much.
TikTok is suing the U.S. government, claiming the new federal law forcing the Chinese-based app company to sell or be banned from the country is unlawful and violates the First Amendment. The social media app argues national security concerns aren't a sufficient reason to restrict free speech and is asking a federal appeals court to block the potential ban. It sets up a court showdown over the responsibility of both big tech and the government to protect Americans' data online, which was the topic of a recent roundtable held by Congressman Frank Pallone, who wants Congress to draft legislation that would create more of those safeguards. Raven Santana has the story. I want to send you PR. I want to, I want to send you a product. I want you to review this. And people will give out their information thinking they're going to get like in a product or something, but then they're just giving out their information and they're susceptible to just their data being sent out to anywhere at that point. Teens may be savvy when it comes to using apps on social media, but 17-year-old Sarah Nasrullah, a junior at Edison High School and member of the Pallone Youth Advisory Council, says she's confident the same can't be said when it comes to privacy. The younger people tend to not trust the government, but bigger corporations because these bigger corporations are promising them things. And I think people just younger generation my like the younger generation and people of my generation aren't reading into the laws that are being passed and what's being put in place to protect them i want people to be more educated about what is being passed that's why she made her concerns heard during a roundtable discussion hosted by congressman frank pallone they were joined by other professors and lawmakers to discuss how to hold tech companies accountable for protecting america's data online is what we find is that not only um problems with privacy in terms of social media, but also everyone trying to basically gather all your private information, whether it's your social security number or your, uh, you know, taste in music, whatever it is, and then um, selling it uh, you know, for profits. Pallone is the ranking member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over technology policy. The committee is currently considering a proposal to create national privacy protections for Americans' data. You know, there's the overall issue that not collecting new data that's not necessary, punishing those who do that, and then also allowing people to go back and erase or delete the data that's already been collected. The proposal comes after President Biden signed a law in April introduced by Pallone to make it illegal for data brokers to sell or otherwise make Americans sensitive data available to China, North Korea, Russia or Iran. The legislation was included in the bill to force the sale of TikTok to a non-Chinese company. That bill has been met with mixed reactions. Oh, it was tremendous pushback. Because, Why? Well, because all the companies that collect all this information want to continue to do so. And so um, this is not going to be easy, easily accomplished. His comments were echoed by other members of the roundtable that shared why. Social media has become the opiate of the people mm -hmm. because people want those 15 minutes of fame or two minutes of fame. Everywhere you go, people want a photograph to put on the gram, and they don't think about what the implications of that is. Well, it has so many implications, whether it's protecting youth or whether it's looking at you know, the health care records and whether, you know, they, that idea of, you know, people believe that, well, we gave you the right to opt out, so, you know, but most people, as you said, they don't know what that means and they don't know how to do it. Pallone and other members at the roundtable discussion all agree that passing the privacy protection legislation currently in committee could also prevent any future privacy and security issues caused by AI. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, recreational cannabis sales just soared to historical highs. Dispensaries across the state sold a record $201 million worth of product in the first quarter of 2024. And according to new state data, hit another sales milestone over the 420 weekend, with more than $5 million in purchases on the unofficial holiday alone. Overall, it shows sales were up by about 38 percent compared to the year before. The State Cannabis Regulatory Commission attributes that to a shift in consumer behavior away from the black market and toward a safer, regulated one. There are also a lot more dispensaries in the state than last year, 130 in all, and the commission expects sales to continue increasing as more dispensaries open. On Wall Street, stocks rose for a fifth straight day, lifted in part by lower Treasury yields. Here's where the markets closed today. 
Support for the Business Report is provided by Riverview Jazz, presenting the 11th Annual Jersey City Jazz Festival, May 29th to June 2nd. Event details, including performance schedules and location, are online at jerseycityjazzfestival.com. And that does it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton, and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.